Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So I think we're going to see a little uh, of the clip, right? I think we are, yeah. But let's see a trailer while I adjust my knees. <laughs> Ghosts are real. That much I know. I've seen them all my life. Would you be mine? Edith, this is my sister. She's the right choice. You have to trust me. Thomas, your bride is frozen. I run you a hot bath. <gasps> there are parts of the house that are unsafe. What was that? The house is old as this one becomes, in time, a living thing. Never go below this level. It starts holding on to things. Has anyone died in this house? Specific deaths, violent deaths. In your own best interest, proceed with caution, keeping them alive when they shouldn't be. If you're here with me, give me a signal. She knows everything. Do we have to do this? Must we? Yes. You have no idea what they do. What do you want? This is your home now. Uh, we are we are also lucky enough today to be joined by the cast. So please also welcome Jessica Chastain, Tom Hiddleston, and Mia Wasikowska. Thank you all so much for being here. Welcome to Google. Uh, so this movie was terrifying. And <laughs> I spent most of it just kind of like slowly sinking into, and then jumping up every once in a while. And so congratulations. Um, you know, it's, it's this kind of horrific Jane Eyre meets Flowers in the Attic meets The Shining is what I felt watching it and that and terror. Can you talk about some of the influences from it? Well, the, in, in the 18th century, uh, at the end of it, in a reaction towards uh, the age of reason, there was a counter movement of romanticism. And one of the things that was created by, uh, back then was Gothic romance. And now Gothic romance, they used to call it a pleasing terror, you know, in the Victorian drawing or, uh, rooms. And uh, it was uh, a very titillating mix of violence, uh, sexuality, and it was the, the first time that in literature uh, somebody uh, created a romantic uh, sensation about the past. Gothic romance is about the past and about the marriage of love and death. So it's sort of the proto-emos of the, of the <laughs> world were birthed then. And then in Victorian era, it became an in incredibly popular. Uh, it affected Jane Austen. It affected Charles Dickens, the Brontes. I mean, you can feel the repercussions of it on uh, anything from the Secret Garden to Wuthering Heights to Great Expectations. And uh, to our days, I mean, I think that in many ways, that genre is still alive, very, very different now. Uh, a lot of people, when you say gothic romance, they imagine Fabio in the cover <laughs> of a paperback novel in an airport, carrying a, a girl full of, uh, you know, very ornamental dresses, you know. But ultimately, that's that's part of the spirit. But it's 
is a genre that exists somewhere within fairy tale and horror and romance. You're not going to get pure horror, and you're not going to get uh, You Got Mail or Sleepers in Seattle. You're going to get a very strange mixture, but beautiful, I think. So what was it exactly that drew you to this you know, oh, beautiful? Been, it seems I, to fit your kind of I, filmmaking I've a, style. I've been a freak for it since <laughs> I was a kid. I mean, I read uh, the first movie I saw at age four was Wuthering Heights. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that had anything to do, but that, that was the first movie. And I've said it in interviews uh, more than a decade and a half ago, so I'm not especially changing it for Crimson and Piggies. <laughs> My mother took me to, to the movie, and uh, I was terrified, and I was mesmerized. It was the first time I saw a movie on the big screen. And I started reading you know, the, the, the typical things, Jane Eyre, uh, Wuthering Heights and so forth, and little by little I graduated. Um, I have a big collection of Gothic romance, uh, Anne Radcliffe, which you read, you know, mm -hmm. Anne Radcliffe uh, was the preeminent uh, Gothic romance writer. Uh, and finally there's a novel that I recommend for anyone curious called Uncle Silas mm -hmm. by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. And it has a lot of the crimson spirit there, but I wanted to make a movie that was beautiful and, and sort of really creepy and dark at the same time. Um, one thing I, I loved about this movie is that you have two very powerful female characters. And, yeah. and gothic romance doesn't always, sometimes it's, oh, she's a girl, and it meets a guy, and there's something going on. But this is two yeah. very strong-willed women. Um, so ladies, could you talk about kind of your involvement in the film and what it was like to step into these characters? Um, the characters kind of evolved as we went along, and um, Guillermo was super collaborative with us, and um, we had a lot of opportunities to discuss with him, and then he really kind of helped us tailor the characters to, to ourselves in a way, that, or you know, make choices that made it easier for us or um, more truthful for us, and that's really rare in a director and really always so appreciated, so it was great. I was really excited when I got the script. Uh, because I'm not used to being in movies where actresses get to talk to each other, <laughs> and I'm always <laughs> looking for that. Uh, I, you know, I did the help, and that was probably the best experience of my life working with those women. And um, so I was very excited about this. And then also, uh, Guillermo had talked to me about um, Lucille and Edith being kind of two types of love, and there was something about Lucille that I just found so heartbreaking and devastating and um, and I just wanted to explore it it was a it was a minefield of where you could go um, psychologically and and how deep you could go into a character which for an actor that's what you want to do it was it was wonderful sort of seeing I, I feel like your character kind of represented this sort of innocence and progression and wanting to move forward with love and then your character was so steeped in like the tradition in the past and like they both yeah. We're kind of fighting for your character, Tom, who is sort of stuck in the middle between these yeah. two important women in his life. And so <laughs> um, uh, you, you guys kind of have a very interesting dynamic that progresses over the film. Um, what, what to you was kind of the, like, the point where you were like, I, I am solid in this character. This is her decision to stake her claim um, in, I guess, Tom's character. <laughs> um, I constantly, it's funny, I see the movie now too, and this is, <laughs> I was talking to someone in Toronto and they had just seen the film, and I was like, isn't Thomas Sharp so selfish? <laughs> like going on and on. <laughs> I was like, because you know, everything Lucille does, she does for history and the family, and for every decision she makes is for her brother. Yeah. And, and she even tries to protect Edith in the beginning of the movie by saying she's too young and you know, no. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> the very That's beginning. <laughs> Lucille tries to protect Edith. That is the a statement that is open to interpretation. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, that's, but that's true. The, the I know what you mean, though. Sorry, I, I'm just I'm just teasing. There, there, there is a sorry. You go, Guillermo. You no, have no. more interesting things to say. You have a better accent. <laughs> <laughs> my accent uh, is is not uh, that charming. No, yeah, I I find it personally very charming. Thank you, my friend. Um, what did I interrupt? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I think I think in terms of uh, what Jessica reads as Thomas's selfishness is actually a sort of struggle for for freedom and free will, and the film dramatizes um, a, a, a tension between the past and the future. 
um, is that Thomas Sharp, my character, feels like he's 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 um, bound up by the past and literally uh, haunted by the secrets of the past and, and in love with the future, literally, and in, in, and in love, <laughs> yeah, in love with the future, in love with Edith, um, eventually, and that I think is uh, in so many ways. Got, that's what Crimson Peak dramatizes is um, is that is that every each all three of us and our characters have a struggle to be free. We're all fighting for something different, and um, and it's about how the secrets of the past can catch up with you if you if you don't confront them, um, and somehow the three characters become self-aware over the course of this of, of the story. They they there is a kind of uh, a battle for the truth, and once the truth is out in the open air, um, some kind of resolution can be can be found. But that was what Henry James defined gothic romance. He said it's about, and and it was so perfect. He said it, it's about the the ghosts represent the past, mm. and it's the struggle to move into the future. You know, and and it really, it's so well put, so so eloquent, and and. Uh, you know the idea. The idea for me in these movies normally, uh, even even when um, uh, they are they are mostly directed by men, and they are mostly oriented towards uh, some ideas of the past about uh, the feminine. That's why I love the Brontes. You know the Brontes are so progressive for their time, and they are so full of real uh, sort of almost like a hall of mirrors. Of neurosis and, and real complexity, and I wanted very much to not make it about who saves the heroine. Mm -hmm. now, I, I'm not spoiling. You guys saw it, right? So I'm not spoiling anything. Yeah. <laughs> Big spoilers if you anyone is here by mistake or wants the canapes. <laughs> <laughs> but no. the idea, I wanted her to save herself, and I wanted her, in fact, to be the one that saves the hero, the guy that was going to save her. Mm. Proves and I and I tried to make to different different degrees the male figures quite useless in a way. <laughs> and uh, Thomas is almost uh, a teenager emotionally, in that he he's he's been loved and bullied and manipulated, no pun intended, <laughs> into into being completely dependent on on Lucille, is the sister and the mother and the lover and it's everything, and he kind of goes along and. Uh, the father is dominant, but he's incapable of having a really mature conversation with the daughter. And, and, and Edith become, become a really strong woman. I, I remember when we were shooting, we would have weeks and weeks of Edith being scared. And then I, I would need to promise Mia, tomorrow you won't be scared. Tomorrow you'll be strong. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> but you had to map it. Yeah, I think one of my favorite lines was about uh, wanting to be um, Mary Shelley, not Jane Austen. Yeah. Like, well, she did not have it. You know, and the, um, the funny thing is she gets her wish. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very, she is a and, widow. <laughs> she, she predicted that one. Um, yeah. But no, it was, it's this wonderful sense that she, she's in this relationship because she wants to be, not because that's what society expects of her. Um, and I thought the scenes with your father were great because was, it was like, oh, yeah, that's, like, she doesn't care. <laughs> you know, she's very modern in that sense and that she, whatever, you know, um, and that she wants to pursue her own career and, and isn't going to be bothered by kind of what other people think. Um, what was it like uh, working with the, uh, your father character in it? Because it seemed like such a short-lived, important yeah. part of it. Well, Jim was wonderful to work with. And it, I think we actually shot all those scenes at the very end. So we sort of started with all the stuff in the house and all the horror and it progressively got more and more of a nightmare and then um, we got to the end and we had the last three weeks were around like outside in um, Toronto and felt like a different film to um, have some of those really lovely scenes with Jim and, um, and go actually back to the beginning after filming the end. Yeah. Um, let's talk about ghosts <laughs> because they are awesome. Uh, yeah. no, <laughs> um, the, so the ghosts in this movie as you were saying you know they do represent the past in a sense but there's also a very physical, metaphysical representation yeah. of yeah. them. Yeah. Um, can you talk about where you decided to use them uh, visually as opposed to this kind of, you know, the specter of them and, and there's, you know, I don't know how these people lived in this house. <laughs> like, yeah. It's terrifying. But the, the, the thing is, uh, there are two things that are counterpoint in Crimson. One of them is obviously in the normal 
movie that is gothic and horror and all that, you, you want the, the whole audience is rooting for the villains to be killed. And when they get killed, you cheer. And that's a huge release. And I, I wanted to go counter. And if we did our job right, for you to actually feel progressively more ambivalent about the villains and, and go, Jesus, they do have a story. They do have a back. And the same with the ghost. The problem is the easiest way to scare someone is to give the ghost an, a Judeo-Christian or a moral value. Like you can say it's demonic. And instantly people go, oof, I understand. Each construct is own, but it's easy to make it scary because they're demonic. Or you say, in this house there lived a, a, a woman that murdered her five children and stabbed her husband 20 times in the eye. Oh my God! You know that's uh, already there's a moral value. But the tricky line that I decided to do in Crimson is the ghost needed to be revealed to be wanting to help Edith. So I couldn't make them evil. I still needed to make them creepy, but. I couldn't get, take full advantage of the other stuff. And uh, what we did is we said, well, they're all trying to warn her, but conveniently, the first ghost has no tongue. <laughs> no, the second ghost has a, a broken neck. And it's finally the mother that can talk. You know? and, and so we did it progressively. And we wanted very much, uh, I decided to make them physical for the actors to have them on the set. You know, I didn't want them to be acting against a tennis ball with an X, you know, because it helps much more to have it there. You know, it's, it's just a decision. I believe in makeup effects. I believe in the craftsmanship of that. And the whole movie, the proposal of the movie was to, for it to feel like a handmade film. From the wardrobe to the sets to the makeup, I wanted it to be, for lack of a better analogy, an installation a world that you could fall into, you know? I think the, the best sort of manifestation of that is the house itself. Yes. Uh, which was horrifying and beautiful at the same time, where it felt very real. And it was, I'm sure for you guys, it was great actually being in a tactile scenario, <laughs> you know, yeah. not being like, please talk to this green wall of books. Um, <laughs> but uh, for me, the house actually also sort of became a character in this, this sort of symbolic form of your your siblings past and what they're holding on to and it's just in this state of decay um what was it like shooting there <laughs> well, what was i mean even if you look at this i haven't seen these costumes in a long time they're very painful to wear <laughs> 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 like all, all my shoulders go up as soon as i see it i never tried them <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, what's incredible about it is um, the way Guillermo and the team designed is, is that uh, Thomas and Lucille are of the house. And so, so much so that the colors kind of blend into each other. And there was even a hallway with the spikes around that looked like teeth. And those are on my dress. Mm -hmm. So there's these, all these subtle details. And when I, the first time I went to the house when they were building it, I saw it in many stages. It actually informed the character so much. I mean, she is really physically part of her past. She, you know, it's painful for her to, to leave. If you see it again, and then I'm sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll continue going there. But, but if you see it again, the, some architectural details are in the lace. So I wanted Lucille to be the house, very much to be linked. And if you see it again, when she gets angry, the house breathes. Even when she's off camera on the beginning, she's looking through the keyhole, and the house breathes because he's too near to her, and she's watching. And every time that she's going to get this flare, the house breathes. And, and, and it's because, like in the House of Usher, another magical tale of incest, <laughs> you know, the fall in the House of Usher, Edgar Allan Poe's, the house represents the decay of the characters. It's sort of a... a sort of a, 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 an entity that contains them all, you know? Sorry to interrupt, but keep going that way. Well, um, honestly, the, the set on Crimson Peak was, was the most beautiful set I've ever seen. Uh, the, most, the most fully realized, um, architecturally sound set I've ever worked on. It was, uh, it was really extraordinary. It was like, because often, uh, often, as actors, we if it's a if it's a, a smaller film that's set in the contemporary world, you use real locations. If you you know if you're shooting in a restaurant, you could find the restaurant and shoot there, but it all feels natural. Or or if you're in a, in a very um, 
if you're in another another realm, another universe, that there necessarily is so much post-production um, computer graphics. Uh, but this was was physically there, and it was like stepping through a magic portal into another world. It was truly a, a, um, an immersive experience, and I think that the, the time we all spent on the set was about six weeks. Mm. Um, six weeks of shooting at the beginning and, and using different parts of the house. You could walk up the stairs, you, you know. Um, everything you see, it was real. And for us, I think, not having to supply the detail with our imaginations and just having to live and breathe and behave and respond to each other in the house was, was is a really rare privilege as an actor. It was very claustrophobic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Six weeks in that house I was pretty tough. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think the house is such an important symbol, and especially for your two characters who are in a very interesting kind of power dynamic. Um, you yeah. know, they are siblings, but it's a time, it's a very patriarchal time, and yet yeah. Lucille wears the not pants, but pants. <laughs> like yeah. She wears the petticoats, I guess, in the relationship. Um, but to me, it was about very much kind of breaking out of tradition and breaking away with family, which is doubly hard to do, and then some extra complications that come along with the, their relationship. <laughs> yeah. um, what was what was kind of that development like for those characters? Because it's, you know, your character kind of came into his own with a certain set of consequences uh, out of that. And, sure. You know, well done for not spoiling anything. I'm trying not yeah. to. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We can't spoil anything. No, <laughs> <but> <laughs> in real time. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, one one of the things there was a, w a wonderful weekend uh, where before we started, about two weeks before we started, I was um, doing a play in London, and Jessica and Guillermo came to see me and, and uh, to see me in it, which is lovely. And then the next day, we spent the whole day together talking about this relationship. Um, and uh, and we have been friends before too, yeah. so. It was a very comfortable place yeah. to start from working. And, and it was, you know, it really was about jumping straight into the, the complex intimacy between them. You know, they have, they have been codependent from a very, very young age, um, uh, grown up without parents, um, you know, from, from, from pre-teenage years, essentially. And, um, and so there is a, there is a degree of, of intimacy which is... Uh, which is actually very precious and very delicate. Um, and the difficulty comes when, when, of course, their individual desires and characteristics start to separate. And uh, so I think actually kind of calibrating that and plotting that out was, um, was, was fascinating. I, I personally found it mm. fascinating to, to really kind of find the points of difference um, and the points of similarity, um, which I felt were very can be very true. People, people are different from each other. And there's something very interesting in that this is 1901, um, and uh, we'd, th the period setting is, not an a is an age where, and this is what Edith is pushing against, rightly, um, is a woman's power is expressed through the men closest to her. Um, and I think it's amazing that that's what Guillermo has decided to put at the center of his film, that it's about, um, it really is about female strength. Um, uh, but, but Lucille, and maybe you could speak to this, but Lucille is having, is forced into a situation where her status is expressed through Thomas, but Thomas has his own ideas and his own ambitions um, and, and his own heart, quite simply. Um, it is the very individual um, heartbeat he has, which separates them in the end. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, speaking what you were, you know, along the lines of what you're talking about with the patriotic article, um, society. These are two people that have made every decision together, uh, you know. And then it's really interesting when, you, when the movie begins. It's you actually, without knowing it, when you're watching the film, you witness the cracks in that because. For the first time, I think, in their lives, he starts to make decisions without her. Mm. Uh, so you see that from the very beginning of the film. And then when we get back to the house, that really is where Lucille starts to, f to gain her power again. Mm. Um, so much so that even with the 
the costumes and the sets, you know. Um, Lucille, the longer she's in the house, the bigger she gets, mm -hmm. even with cl her clothing. That happened to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Catering. <laughs> Done but your craft services. <laughs> but also with Mia, with the she would get smaller. Uh, the 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 um, furniture around her would get larger. We we made the furniture in several sizes, but also the Lucille has this condescending point of view the, about what it is to be a female in the world. I mean, yeah. she's she's a she's a character with many scars, and I think that I I make a point that I find it very funny, but it's very cruel. When you see the portrait of the mother, you have no, you have no doubt of their upbringing. <laughs> so, uh, and then they talk about their father breaking her mother's leg. I mean, what a family. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but she makes a point to, to Edith that if you're pretty, you're delicate. And I think that, that's the wrong information. And, and I think that that's why we use the motif of the moths and the butterflies. So Lucille thinks she's a moth. And she's all powerful and, you know, dark and and that that Edith is, because by virtue of being, of a sunny disposition or American, or young and pretty, she must be a little butterfly that she's gonna be able to pin, to her wall. And and the whole point for me was to show that butterflies can be, brutal, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think uh, even visually you did such a lovely job of having, you know, you stood out in the house in these wonderful yellow colors, which are, are you kind of, and mm -hmm. I saw them assemble one of those. Kudos to you for wearing that <laughs> because that thing looked complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it was very interesting. Did you feel kind of being dressed that way and being in this kind of, did that help you uh, kind of step into that part of it? Or? Yeah, they're definitely super uncomfortable, <laughs> and, you know, horrible. And I've swore after my first period film, I'd never do another one again. And, uh, <laughs> that hasn't happened. <laughs> but um, they're great. They do give you like a certain kind of, there's only really one option <laughs> to in how to carry yourself and be so, there is a certain amount you draw from them, and they're really beautiful. And Kate, who designed them, is just a genius. So, I, I, yeah, I have like a love-hate relationship with them for sure. You're a very strong butterfly in them. Oh, so. <laughs> Thank you. I had various different wings, <laughs> different sizes, they're large wings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to bring up a point just because I felt like this was a parent's cautionary tale because there was a line in the uh -huh. beginning that it was, it was your father's character and he just goes like, I don't like him and I don't know why. And I just wrote, I scribbled down and I was like, listen to dad. <laughs> <laughs> just listen to dad. And then your, you know, your mother kind of warning you against stuff. And uh, it, was, it was very interesting kind of having these specters of, of parental history uh, speak out against this male character and just go, nope, like, Nope, bad idea, bad idea. Um, I wasn't sure if that was kind of guiding away from the, the historical role of a gothic romance um, no, no, male, the, or? The idea, the idea for me is, what is interesting for me is that there is, uh, Thomas arrives to that meeting, I think, with all every intention to woo all the American investors, her father in particular, and there's a very subtle moment where the father notices that She's looking at him from the door, and he doesn't like that. You know, it's, it's, it's this very patriarchal thing from the 19th and 20th century where daughters, uh, basically, if they didn't marry, they, they took care of the father, you know? And, and there is that sort of jealousy, and he doesn't like him because of that, but also the beauty for Thomas is that I think he likes Edith, but little by little, he falls in love with her, and on the beginning, he actually, I think, he invites her to the waltz to sp to uh, offend the father or to go against that that he feels. But I think that is is those little things that interest me. I I think the father is a character I understand, but I think that it's a character that I sympathize with in many ways. But he 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 should he should have just straight out like in every melodrama, there are things that some people don't say. He's your, he's your father, you're her brother, whatever. They keep it for the whole movie. And, and the father should have told her straight away. This is why I don't like him, I found out this. But he didn't trust her to be that strong. That's what is, that's what is interesting. I think uh, parents in the movie are the root of, 
of all these graces. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to do is most of these movies end up with the, the, the dark and brooding gentleman actually being innocent. And then he can be condoned and married. And this, I wanted them to love each other in spite of what he had done. And for horror to start with the marriage, not end. Because mm. normally these movies end, everybody's happy throwing rice. And, <laughs> and I say, no, 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 that's when things start, actually. <laughs> yeah. This is life after that. <laughs> <laughs> say what you will about that implies about marriage. But, also, um, I just, can I just, to a point, I'm going to embarrass Guillermo now, but I... I uh, the, 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 the novels. You're going to talk about my tennis shoes now? <laughs> <laughs> the very beautiful shoes. Male, male Come nurse um, model. <laughs> the, uh, I'm not going to talk about Guillermo's footwear. Um, he, the, he, he, when I uh, came onto the film, he shared a number of Gothic romance novels with me, um, chief among which was, as he's already mentioned, The Mysteries of Udolfo by Anne Radcliffe, um, which is, I think, almost the first time a writer had, had had written a story about the supernatural explained in terms of past trauma. Um, but there was, sh in a way, if she, she was one of the primary inventors of, of the genre of gothic romance, a young, innocent heroine, a tall, dark stranger, uh, to whom she is drawn by some sort of um, sexuality and charisma only to be surprised and terrified by certain secrets. Um, and that seems to be like what Gothic romance is all about. So the rebellion against parents is, it's, is a way of taking possession of your own sexuality, I think, saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chase this. Mm -hmm. But then the twin aspect of Gothic romance is the prospect of death, is that, you, is that sometimes uh, your sexuality can put you in a dangerous situation and af you know, after which you will never be the same. And I think that's what Guillermo so beautifully um, kind of brings together in this film is, it is uh, while doffing his hat to traditional Gothic romance, he inverts it and confounds people's expectations. I think it's, I personally think it's like. It's also, uh, it's also important to show the heroine fucking and surviving. <laughs> 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 Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, the, the uh, Gothic romance and fairy tales have, are two types. Anarchic or repressive. A lot of the fairy tales are be careful and obey your parents, and 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 horror functions in many ways the same way, and it requires chastity from the main character or sexuality gets punished. And we, when we were working, we said we have to make it a point mm. that she is not pure, nor she is, and she has to be in charge of the sex scene. She has to be willing and. It has to be, uh, you know, a given that is not is not a negative. I mean, I think I think the movies, and when you go against so many things against the grain, there's a different feeling to the movie. Sometimes less commercially able to entrap you, but I think it's far more satisfying in the long run. I mean, it felt much more sort of realistic. It's like mm -hmm. we can't. Ex you the human race has continued on, and there's one way it did that. Well, <laughs> so right, pharmacists right. would sell, if it was real, pharmacists would sell condoms and a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Just in <Yeah>. case. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my God. But no, it was, it was definitely an interesting kind of embrace of just like being like, look, they, and, and I like that your character initiates it, you know, she's yeah. very embracing of it. She knows that this is something logical that comes as the next step in their relationship. And when, you know, Thomas is kind of reticent, she's like, nope, we're gonna I'm going to find a way to make this happen. Like, <laughs> I'm going to make you some tea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, not to that. Yeah. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> um, there's a kind of th thing that does go hand in hand with the amount of passion and stuff that goes into this film, and that's the violence that comes out of it. Mm. Um, and it's just, it felt the very kind of the other side of that coin, where it's like these are our very passionate, caring characters who maybe don't know how to communicate. And she was, <laughs> yeah. she was raised by this uh, horrible parent. Yeah. And the way they communicated was through that. that was I mean, that. you understand that she has scars yeah. in her face. There was a scene where she used to have her back exposed, and she has huge scars in her back. She took canings for her brother. She says that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, she sort of. You know, uh, I think all all the mistakes that exist in the world initiate in childhood. If we if we took care of children for the first 10, 12 years of their life, 
the world would be perfect. But it's because that is, that is what destroys them as kids, and they carry it the rest of their life. Yeah. Uh, we're going to open it up to audience questions in a moment, if anyone wants to line up. Uh, one question I'm really afraid to ask is Guillermo, but uh, what's something I that wait? scares... No, oh my God. No. I was going to say, I'm afraid to ask, what's something that scares you? You know, uh, people. People, I mean, I'm afraid of politicians. I'm afraid of, <laughs> of superstructures. I mean, I think, I think that uh, we live in a world where uh, I think that another thing that scares me, and this is why I made the movies, because I, I, I thoroughly believe in love, and I think that love has become almost something to be afraid of. I mean, we are almost in the equivalent of modern times to Victorian times. Victorian times was afraid of sexuality, and they used these tales to talk about sexuality in a veiled way. And uh, I think that we, we are in a world where I feel we, we, we become very reticent to talk about emotion and love. That scares me a lot, and I think uh, because we, we don't want to be vulnerable. We want to, the, the automatic cool is to be distant and aloof. And you instantly are smarter if you're skeptic. And I think if you're a believer, you instantly sound stupider. And these things scare me quite a bit. And, and you can see it like when people think about why does Twilight is so successful. Strangely enough, for whatever gothic elements Twilight has, you realize that now we're using it to articulate uh, love. That's what they couldn't make. They couldn't talk about sex in Victorian era, and now the only way that a fantasy about a perfect love can be articulated is gothic. You know, this strange. The guy has to be a vegetarian vampire. You know, and and, and, and never. It, sp it speaks of the mores of our time. It, it feels very kind of cyclical where we're kind of reverting yeah. back in this. <laughs> um, all right. Well. Hi. When we were watching the trailer earlier, I had two thoughts go through my mind. The first was, I wonder how many times you have seen that trailer <laughs> as, you, as you were standing in the back. Uh, but the second question was, when I saw the trailer, I thought there was going to be a lot more about ghosts. And I was curious how you decided, what's the process of making that trailer? How do you decide what you include and what you cut? Well, actually, uh, i got to speak this way because they put the little thing here. But... Uh, <laughs> it's very strange, but I, actually the, the, the filmmakers involved somewhat in the marketing, but not fully. You know, I, you have to watch uh, with faith and horror when they market your movie. Uh, and, and, and it's a mixture, depending on how good the marketing department is. They capture the essence of the movie somehow. Now, Gothic Romance is particularly cagey, because it's not a horror. If you go expecting a full-blown horror movie, you're not going to get it. And if you go expecting full-blown romance, you're not going to get it. So I, I actually think Crimson is hard to, to communicate the full spectrum of the movie. I think it's more a drama with ghosts in it, which is what Edith says about her story. Uh, but how do you communicate that in a, in a sort of purely commercial way? So I don't know. I love the trailers that they've been doing. I think they represent one side of the movie. And inevitably, there will be a side of the movie that people have not seen that they'll discover in the theater. But that's why we do these things. That's why if you like it, help us send the word out. Tell, tell your friends, you youngsters, and, and, <laughs> and all those things, you know? Thanks. And I've seen it a shed a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> An actual number count. <laughs> oh, yeah, shed a lot. Hey, um, this is a question for Tom. I'm a huge fan of everyone, but especially Tom. <laughs> um, and my question was, it's actually really funny because I like you a lot as an actor, but I found your character the most despicable of the characters in the movie. Okay. And so I felt this inner conflict, which is really <laughs> Because I feel like Lucio was so obviously messed up towards the end, you, you could tell. Um, but your character, you know, you could sense a bit of good in him, but that almost made his actions worse. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and then maybe how you drew that out in your portrayal. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, I think I found um, the, reason I wanted to, the, the reason I wanted to play Thomas was when I first read it, I, I could see a character embroiled in um, some very dark action and material. Um, 
so guilty and so ashamed and, and really struggling to free himself, uh, struggling to somehow right the ship back onto an even keel, someone who was actually impelled by, who understood, who was beginning to understand his own shame. There was so much shame in the character and, uh, and someone who was actually innately gifted. I, t I think the engineering his engineering gift, his mechanical um, sort of inspiration and capacity is a very genuine talent. And someone, if he, if he had been a, a healthier kind of man, would have maybe gone on to be a great industrialist, a great engineer. Um, and I think, I truly think that e Edith is a, a light which shines on him and it takes him completely by surprise. And, and she shows him how to be good. And, and then for the rest of the story, he's struggling to weigh his responsibility for the past and his desire for freedom, his sense of responsibility to Lucille and his love for her, which is unhealthy in lots of ways, but he still loves her. It and it comes from damage. You know, one of the defining quotes that we, as a headline for us was, damaged people are dangerous because they know how to survive. And and, and in spite of what you found despicable, which is completely within your rights to feel. Um, <laughs> He's crying uh, in the inside. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it was, no, no, it's okay. Because actually the, the reason I wanted to play it was it was someone moving from a place of shame to try to be a better man. And I, I do think that there is a redemption, that he, he achieves a kind of redemption. Without spoiling anything, it's clearly not an easy one. Um, and there is a catharsis that he finally is able to concede uh, responsibility and, and take and be accountable for what he's done. But he makes a couple of very, very good choices towards the end. And uh, so I, in a way, I, I will defend him to the death, but then so <laughs> would these fine ladies at my side. So that part of the job of an actor is, yeah. is, to, be de is, to, is, to, is to fill the shoes of somebody else from a place of compassion. So I can only, I can only feel his, um, I can only feel and understand his pain. And you know, if, if I were to have to defend him, I would say, well, he is who he is because of what happened to him. And, and, and as Guillermo said, those choices were taken away from him when he was very young. Um, so it, it actually has this beautiful arc from, from shame to freedom. Sorry, okay, thank you. Good. And I'm still a fan. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you, director and the cast, for um, give, giving me a very terrifying and a violent movie yesterday. <laughs> I was uh, kind of shaking four or five times in the, my seat when I saw some of the hands creep in and like, uh, the, the thing on the head <laughs> of that ghost was pretty like, scary. Um, <laughs> so my question was that initially, when the, in the, even in the character of um, Mia's character, where she tries to um, get her story about ghosts get through, and she's uh, com sh the reaction she gets is like, "Hey, why don't you? Nobody wants to really see ghosts. They, do they really like it? Why don't you do a love story?" And she's like, "No, it's just a story with ghosts in it. It's not yeah. a ghost story, right?" So in the re in real life, like I rarely come get to see that many ghost stories. Mm -hmm. it's, if you look at movies, most of them are like the characters. Um, like they try to say it's more like love stories and feel good movies. This one came up, so I jumped into the chance to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, last one I think I saw was Evil Dead in the 80s or 90s. Yeah. So, um, how do you as. Man, I gotta give you a, a watching list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some came, but then the ghosts were more like shadows and they didn't make yeah. sense. I was mostly laughing along the way, but this one was different. I didn't laugh at all. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but what you say, uh, actually, that, that used to happen. Like uh, the Brontes, all the Brontes sisters, all of them, had to publish under a pseudonym, a male pseudonym. They kept their initials, CB, you know, AB, and so forth. But they, they, they had to, to publish under a male pseudonym and purposely, in many ways, even change their narrative a little so it was less evident that they were female. And to this day, I mean, for, I, I called her Edith for Edith Wharton, who was, in my opinion, as good with ghostly tales as Henry James. But people tend to qual disqualify her as a pale imitator of Henry, Henry James. I mean, it, it is, it, th those were things based in, in some facts. 
And what I like is that if you watch carefully at the end in the credits, she wrote the novel about Crimson Peak. And her first experience is based on a ghost that appeared to my mother when she was a kid. Oh. Her, her grandmother sat on her bed the night she died and touched her in the shoulder. And she heard the springs in the bed creaking. And she used to tell me these things irresponsibly when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. <laughs> is that the how do you like judge between whether to make this kind of a movie which are very rare in general compared to versus like hey let's make a love story as like actors how do you j jump in to do it versus as a director how do you like try to like weigh between the movies I only do weird shit <laughs> <laughs> basically <laughs> then they can answer <laughs> they can answer themselves I've, this is the second time I've worked with Guillermo. Uh, I did uh, Mama with him that he produced. And um, I like doing his weird movies so much. The, the character of Lucille, I, you know, sometimes actresses, actors, everyone gets typecast. And I'd never played a character like that. And I just loved her. So that's, uh, for me, it was a great opportunity to play the role. I, 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 I'm always drawn to um, in a complex material, I think. Uh, I I enjoy um, I enjoy characters who have a very uh, kind of have deep souls in a way. They're complex people because I think most people are actually very complex. And so if I read a, um, a piece of writing like this was, you can it, the, the sensitivity and the delicacy with which the human characters are written was incredibly inspiring. Um, uh, I tend to think the types of characters, some of the types of characters you see in movies, you know, they, um, I'm sure we could all think of things that we just go, that was a bit thinly drawn, and these characters were so multi-dimensional, they seemed, they seemed so rich, so real, in a way. Um, and I'm a big fan of this guy. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did it. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> of you, I mean. <laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> um, I I just like same wanted to work with Guillermo. I think he's brilliant, and I loved his films, and um, and I really liked the character, and I wanted to see what would happen with it and where it would go, and um, yeah, and it was it was a great experience. So yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, it was such a pleasure to have you, and everyone go enjoy Crimson Peak. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you very much.